Why didn't Tony Abbott win government in 2010? Oh, there was a number of reasons. I, I think, one, it's very difficult to win an election in the first term. Uh, you know, it, 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 it's hardly ever been done. Um, Is that he, because he, people don't like to... They, they want to give the government the benefit of the doubt? He, or? Well, I don't think there's a, there's, there's a practical issue here, which is it was a very large swing um, to overcome a very big swing to Kevin Rudd in the previous election. He nearly got there, but I think what you've seen is one election in two stages. Um, essentially, over those two elections, 2010 and 2013, the issues have been much the same. Um, the three leaders have been much the same. Um, the tensions on the economy, on immigration uh, and on the urban dynamic have been much the same. So you've really had one election in two parts. Tony Abbott had a really simple message in this election, which he kept driving home. It was stop the boats, stop the big new taxes, end the waste and pay back the debt. So it's sort of three issues, maybe four topics. It's very catchy. Is that what connected with people? No. What connected with people is essentially um, in a world where there's fragmented leaders, where there's political instability around the world, economic instability around the world, changing dynamics in media, clarity is king. So you had governments ducking and weaving on their positions on, on those same issues, on immigration, on taxes, and changing their positions. And Abbott's position was and is very clear. So one of the reasons he said what he said was not necessarily the alleged popularity of those positions, and they weren't universally popular, by the way, nothing is, um, but the absolute clarity of those positions. So you could disagree with Tony Abbott, but even if you disagreed with Tony Abbott, you could not disagree that you knew absolutely what he stood for. What about with Julia Gillard, particularly when she was accused of breaking promises uh, as Prime Minister compared to when she was standing for the election in 2010? Mm. What's your perspective on how that plays out with the public? Uh, well, I think it was b part of a broader story. You can go to the trust bank once. Um, like in any relationship, in a marriage, you break trust once and it's never quite the same again. Um, with uh, Gillard, she'd already uh, basically taken out of that bank a huge chunk of capital because she said, look, I know I've just knifed a prime minister that you voted for, but trust me, I can govern the country well. So when effectively the second tranche of that came around, she said, well, actually, I'm going to ask you to trust me again in believing that after knifing a sitting prime minister, that somehow in breaking my promise on tax, you can still trust me, was just one um, uh, withdrawal too many from that bank of trust. Did you see the knifing of Julia Gillard, in your words, as uh, being political gold? Oh, I, as a, speaking honest, as a pollster. I, I, I just saw it as sort of juvenile games by I mean, there didn't seem to be any consistency. I saw her making some gains. And she did some, whatever you thought of them, she did, did do, um, make an attempt at, 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 at reforming. I think there were some flaws in her approach. But at least she was starting to build a narrative. But they got nervous in 2010, chopped the leader's head off, and they got nervous again. Uh, in 2013 and chopped the leader's head off. Now, the problem with that is it's more inconsistent behaviour. Tony Abbott has one woman in Cabinet. He clearly loves his wife and his daughters. They were a big part of the election campaign. Mm. Why should half of the Australian population believe that he has their interests at his political heart? By being salient. Now, as to the appropriate mix in Cabinet, the Green movement and the Labor movement, the broader Labor movement, have the advantage of taking uh, people out of um, the union movement positions or the environmental movement positions and slotting them into seats in, in whatever way they, they choose. It is much more difficult, given the constituency 
of the Liberal Party, and then there is no formal connection with the Liberal Party in business. So in order to represent its constituency in that part of the constituency that Labor and the Greens don't represent, that they get those women. Now those women, frankly, probably a lot of them would rather uh, like to earn either money and, and develop their careers um, or um, spend time with family or do other things. But uh, in the cohort, which is the liberal right business centrist part of uh, politics, there's not that efficient system of delivery yet um, uh, to deliver those female candidates. What role did the women in Tony Abbott's family play in the campaign? Oh, look, they were there um, supporting him o on the road, which is very important. It's very important to have your family around you to normalise your right, life in what is a quite a bizarre environment during a campaign. You know, media, uh, gallery packs, um, a whole bunch of uh, friends in your area with gratuitous advice. I'm talking so more about the level. image. Oh, look, it was important uh, that uh, what people found important was that he'd um, obviously, he and Margie had brought up uh, uh, some, you know, very impressive young women, and that said something about um, their um, values as parents and their effectiveness as parents, and people relate to that. Everyone says, you know, what role do they play um, uh, in 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 politics? Well, why shouldn't they play a role? Um, they're members of his family, um, and how you. Uh, you know, everyone these days loves talking about, you know, do we really know politicians anymore? Are they authentic? And when one attempts to do something to demonstrate what you're like outside of politics, people go, well, is that appropriate? So there is um, some hypocrisy in some of these questions. Your social media profile says that 800-plus uh, polling projects, 250-plus campaigns, 60-plus countries What's the greatest lesson that you've learned from your work? It's probably the greatest change. I've seen a greater and greater divide between the reactions of public opinion and the reaction of media, blogsphere and the Twitter rati. It's getting wider every day. In an article recently I've called this the two-speed political economy and there's a functional reason for this. What is happening is the ABC with the drum and Sky with their panels and a lot of radio news show employ a group of people whose billable hours are maintained by talking about politics. And that process is speeding up. So you've got this political analysis which is in the fast lane and the poor voters who are just saying, just tell me what, what that means. What that means. What, what's paid parental leave? Who does it cover? How much is it worth? What's NDIS? Who's it cover? How much is it worth? How has it been paid for? Um, and those basic fundamentals of journalism, which is... Explaining. Explaining things, getting an expert to explaining. You never see experts anymore. And the old way of the masthead journals used to be that the education reporter on an education issue would go out there and speak to a bunch of education experts, get quotes, amass the story together, was given five or six days by the corporation to do this, by you know, News Corporation or Fairfax, and they'd come back and they'd write a story and then they'd use their journalistic abilities to condense that into a conclusion and balance. But now you get journalists talking to other journalists or about commentators. The, or commentators about uh, what they think about this policy. And most people say, who cares? And that's why a lot of media organisations are in terminal decline. They've lost their relevance. Who, what, when, how, why. Mark Texter, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you for speaking with OnePlus One. Thank you.